Mistress, your smock, it has gone astray. My smock? Oh no, it's supposed to be like this. But my lady, won't you be too hot in such a high collar? Lady? I think you are mistaken. Good wife will do just fine for me. But will you not get burned with your smock so low? I'd overheat if I was all covered up like you are. And why is your hair unbound? What will people think of you going out in public like this? Well, no one can even see your hair. I'm gonna cut in here before things get ugly. We're here to talk about Ren Fairs, not fight over each other's costumes. And specifically, we are here to talk about why we should not fight over each other's Ren Fair costumes. Hi, I'm V, costume historian who recognizes that not everything is about history. Renaissance fairs exist in this really interesting space where there are lots of things at the same time, and I see that reflected so much in how people costume for them. I don't think this genre, if you will, gets nearly enough recognition for what it is. Instead, I've heard and seen a lot of historical costumers talking about outfits like this, as though the wearer is trying to look historically accurate and doing it badly, and that's the only possible explanation. No, guys, just no. We don't insult other people's outfits. We don't do that here. By the way, all these gorgeous photos are from audience members like you. Click the subscribe button because in a day or two, I'm gonna put out a short with a full gallery. Aren't you forgetting something? Oh, right. We're also doing a really big giveaway, so make sure you watch the whole video for more info. I've spent a bunch of this month traveling, including to my local Renaissance fair. Two of my friends and I split a hotel room so we could go both days without the two hour drive. Before that, I was in LA for the Jewish Writers Initiative Fellowship Conference. And before that, I was in San Diego doing research with my uncle and his corgi. All this to say that despite the cute dog and cushy hotel, I cannot tell you how happy I am to be sleeping in my own bed again. Back in July, Birch Living sent me one of their non-toxic mattresses, and when I say sent, know that they literally delivered it to my door for free, rolled up in a box, which saved me having to borrow a car and load the thing into a car and haul it out of a car. Birch makes comfortable and environmentally conscious sleep products using organic and natural materials. I don't condone snobbery about natural fibers, but they do have their uses. The wool layers in my Birch Lux mattress are hypoallergenic and resistant to allergens and mildew without any extra harmful processes. All their mattresses are Green Guard Gold certified, and the Lux mattress has an extra long list of certifications. Many, many years from now, when this mattress reaches the end of its life, that wool is going to biodegrade where synthetic materials would not. Birch works with ethical partners that adhere to strict social, environmental, and economic standards, so my conscience finds this mattress as comfortable as the rest of me. That being very. I've had this mattress for two months now and it's the most comfortable thing I've ever slept on, including the cushy hotel beds in LA. Normally traveling messes with my sleep even if I'm not jet lagged. The morning after getting back though, I woke up feeling as well rested as I ever have. I wouldn't say bright eyed and bushy tailed because well, I have fibromyalgia. Morning grogginess is one of the hallmark symptoms, but I wasn't exhausted or in pain or feeling like I needed eight more hours of sleep. The quilted pillow top on the Lux mattress is extra nice for those of us with pressure sensitive muscles. It's the perfect balance of support and softness, but everyone's body is different. So just in case it doesn't work out for you, Birch offers a hundred night sleep trial and will even collect the mattress to spare you the trouble. If you do love it as much as I do, you can look forward to many years of comfy sleep thanks to the 25 year warranty. Visit birchliving.com slash snappy dragon or click the link in the description to get $400 off a new mattress and two free pillows. Thanks to Birch for sponsoring this video and for sparing me my usual post travel crash. Now back to the Ren Fair. Wait, we're going back? I wish, but unless you've learned to drive, no. Hmm. Anyways. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, Sure, we've got me and my hand-sewn kirtle and smock, and we've also got people walking around in elf ears and mushroom hats and fairy wings. Ren fairs are a very different space from a lot of other historical costumed events, so why don't we briefly define our terms? A Ren Fair, short for Renaissance Fair, is an event that combines living history, local fair, craft fair, and theatrical production. It's like a very long, very immersive, very improvised play that's based on a historical setting, with the audience being the customers walking around. There are vendors, stage performances, and cast members or participants who play various real and invented historical characters and either perform for or interact with the fairgoers, often referred to as patrons. 
These events generally are in an outdoor space and run for several consecutive weekends in the spring, summer, or fall. The first Ren Fairs took place amidst the traditional music and hippie movements of the 1960s, and this appears to have had some influence on their aesthetics. I asked my amazing audience members to send in messages about their fair experiences, and I was fortunate enough to get a long and super detailed message from someone who's a costume director at her local fair. Thank you, Amy. She said that 20 to 30 years ago, the standards for participant costumes were much more relaxed. So you'd see a lot more of things like underbust corsets and tiered roughly skirts and tights a la Robin Hood men in tights, stuff that we would consider historically influenced fantasy costuming today. At the time, the Ren Faire in question didn't have cast member costume guidelines beyond something vaguely historical, which led to plenty of issues. Issues like severe thigh chafing and someone going upside down in a skirt, which is why they now have all skirt wearers in bloomers underneath regardless of accuracy. Amy told me the fair in question has since put together much more solid guidelines and support for cast members making their costumes, which has the triple benefit of being fairer, safer, and more accurate to the event's vision. Another person who messaged me told me that their fair provides costumes for cast members who don't have their own, which can be a great way to prevent the money and time needed to make garb from being barriers to people joining. The cast members then only have to provide their own shoes and some accessories. I also had the privilege of meeting some incredibly kind cast members when I visited my local Ren Faire. If you were one of those people, thank you so much for chatting with me, and I'm sorry if I seemed flustered. I spent all of Saturday with a very uncomfortable piece of dust in my eye. A couple of these folks told me about a specific book that's had an extensive influence on Ren Faire costuming, inaccuracies and all, Elizabethan costuming for the years 1550 to 1580, commonly referred to as the Brown Book or Brown Bible. I wasn't able to get a hold of the book in time to film this, but one of the ladies in question saw my call for info on Instagram and sent me photos of the book. It refers to the wearing of separate bodices and skirts, something that current dress history research believes to be incorrect. According to Nicole, the idea of separate skirts and bodices was probably a misinterpretation of bodiced petticoats. A skirt sewn to a supportive underbodice often made of different, plainer, and stiffer material because it wasn't meant to be seen. For more on the evidence around bodiced petticoats, there's a great blog post by the Couture Courtesan linked in the description. Thanks to this book's popularity and the prevailing research at the time, separate bodices and layered skirts became quintessential elements of Ren Faire cast costuming, and strong visual inspiration for participant costumes too. Realistically though, whether you're a cast member or a patron, there are certain aspects of historically accurate 16th century European dress that are much less likely to work out for a Ren Faire. 16th century Europe, especially England, was on average cooler and cloudier than present-day North America during the height of summer. Wool may be breathable, but felted broadcloth when it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit and the UV index is 9 or 10 is not a good idea. Save that for a cold weekend in Minnesota if you can. Modern Ren Fairs have to strike a balance between accuracy and safety and accessibility, how to present the degree of authenticity they're aiming for without the cast members getting heat stroke, and without setting unachievable standards for new and marginalized participants. Although, please do let it be said that some fairs, <coughs> Dickens, <coughs> could do with a deal of improvement on the second and especially third points there. Amy, the costume director who contacted me, works at a fair in an extremely hot climate and told me they've had to insist that no cast member wear synthetic fibers as their inner layer. Not because of historical accuracy, but because synthetic fibers don't breathe well and they had people fainting from heat exhaustion if they wore polyester. However, the fibers accurate to 16th century Europe were mostly limited to wool, linen, and silk for the fancy folks. These can get expensive, and being restricted to these materials shuts out people who could otherwise take part in the community. Cotton and rayon are widely available at a more affordable price point, and can mimic historically accurate fabrics well enough to pass the 10-foot rule. Since they're cellulose fibers, they don't have the breathability issues that synthetics do, and you can wear the layers you need without risking heat exhaustion. Amy said she recommends Kona brand cottons for her cast because they're low priced, easy to find, and not sheer. The frequently hot summer temperatures are also why you see a lot of folks in sleeveless bodices or doublets. Historical accuracy would call for detachable sleeves in many cases, but sticking with shirt or shit sleeves lets the wearer stay cooler while still keeping their skin covered and out of the sun. 
The perk of historically accurate sleeves often being detachable is that you can skip them on hot days, but easily add them for colder ones to avoid needing a totally different outfit. Likewise, we see more folks with bare heads and low necklines on account of modern people being less likely to swoon at the sight of human hair or upper chest. As a very pale sort, I personally like a high neckline for sun protection, but in this modern age we have sunscreen, which means folks can cover up or not depending on what will keep them cooler and more comfortable. There's been more of a trend towards clear guidelines and historical accuracy over the past decade or so, tracking the improvements in dress history research. Some Ren Fairs place a high value on historical accuracy and lean into the living history side of things, while others maintain more of the fair fantasy elements, like off-the-shoulder chemises and roughly skirts, and cast members actually playing fairies. Historical accuracy does have its value, especially when you are portraying a certain historical setting to the general public, but that shift means a greater distinction between accurate costuming or cast member dress codes and, well, everything else. And because of the unique and theatrical nature of Ren Fairs, that is a pretty broad everything else. My favorite elements of Ren Fair style are the enthusiastic inclusions of historically inspired fantasy elements that the historical costuming world holds little space for. Shiny fashion corsets? Go for it. Underbust? Yep, those two. Off the shoulder chemises? Whatever makes you happy. Same goes for free flowing hair and flower crowns and dramatic makeup. When these things show up in historical dramas, we're often highly critical of the lack of accuracy. And I think this makes it all the more important to have a space where historical fantasy costumes are not only acceptable, but form a core part of the style's focus and identity. I can't put my finger on what it is about this outfit that makes it so characteristically Renfair, but I know it when I see it. As for the outright fantasy and cosplay elements of Renfair patron costuming, these are just as important. The messages and emails I got mentioned everything from high fantasy elements to mermaid tank performers swimming around with tails, fairies who will throw glitter on you if you ask, and both new and experienced costumers dressed as fandom characters or in Star Trek uniforms. Mainstream society really only gives us one opportunity a year to wear costumes on Halloween, which is nowhere near enough. Why do you think costume balls were so popular in the Victorian era? Several people also mentioned seeing trends for different fantasy and cosplay elements come and go during their years at Ren Fairs. A viewer called Sarah told me that Maryland Renaissance Festival has a tradition called the Day of Wrong that began as a cast member in-joke but spread to the customers too, of wearing historical clothing from a completely different period on the event's final weekend. Another person mentioned dudes in athletic shorts and t-shirts with random bits of plate armor on over them. Apparently mushrooms are the current thing, because in addition to this viewer's beautiful mushroom hat, I saw one at my local fair too, and lost count of all of the other mushroom-themed accessories. I'm reminded of a Facebook post that circulated at the beginning of 2020. You know, before 2020 actually happened talking about how the release of The Witcher was going to lead to loads of folks going to their local fairs in a hastily made Witcher cosplay. So instead of groaning and grumbling about how The Witcher is a fantasy series and Ren fairs are not fan conventions, we should include them by affectionately tossing coins to our Witchers. I personally would go for foiled covered chocolate coins instead of plastic ones, but the point stands. To quote the OP, by including them in a positive way, we turn them from people who show up once or twice into people who come back over and over and are part of the community. This is exactly my point. The beauty of Ren Fairs is that they're not all about historical accuracy. They're about having fun. They're about stepping into a world that has room for fantasy and self-expression and things that don't happen in everyday life. They're about providing space for members of the public to get costumed up and share in the experience, about including them in a positive way. This is what makes them so popular. So it's completely right for this to be reflected in the costuming, especially for the patrons who are literally just there to play. The expansive, just for fun nature of Ren Fairs can be particularly welcoming to new, casual, or under-resourced costumers. It makes room for costumers from a variety of other genres to play with historical elements without being held to any standard of accuracy but their own. 
For so many of us, me included, visiting Ren Fairs was our gateway experience to the world of costuming. Just think how many of us might have turned away if our first outfits that we felt so great in were looked down on for not being accurate enough. So instead of criticizing Ren Fair costuming for what it's not, let's celebrate it for what it is. It is so special that we have these events where people can wear elf ears and mushroom hats and fairy wings and glitter right alongside hand-sewn historical pieces and anything else that brings them joy. Because at its heart, that's what costuming is all about. I've said it before and will say it again. We're all just here to play dress up and yucking other people's yums ruins the fun for everyone. Please know that I am over here in my hand-sewn kirtle cheering for all of you fantastic folks because you look great. Every single one of you. Speaking of the hand-sewn kirtle, now that I've made new Renaissance kit, it's time for me to clear out my closet a little. So I am giving away my previous Renfair outfit. The giveaway is being run through Instagram because it isn't really possible to run them through YouTube. Click the link in the description and the pinned comment to see the full details and how to enter. This outfit definitely has some Renfair core elements. There's a cotton chemise with full gathered sleeves, two cartridge pleated skirts, and a reversible bodice, which is the only piece I didn't sew myself. Even if this outfit won't fit you, you can still help it find a new home with a costumer who needs it by sharing this video and the giveaway post on your socials. Leave me a comment with your favorite Ren Faire story, or historical event story, if you're in a place that doesn't do Ren Faires. I've got a lot of exciting stuff going on behind the scenes during the next month, so don't forget to subscribe here for updates and click the like button so YouTube knows you liked what you saw. You can follow me over on Instagram at Miss Snappy Dragon and on Patreon for the extra special secret updates. See you next time. I am not sunburned, so I will not need to sit in a corner and cry hey-ho for a husband.